tonight, you know, it's been a while since we had anything on dietitian. Um, we, we've had them in before and we've answered a lot of questions, myths, cancer myths about diet and sugar, no sugar, you know, do you eat salad, do you eat ice cream, sugar, what do you do and all that good stuff. And um, so I thought, you know what, we need a new dietitian to come in, some fresh ideas. And so Tolly at the hospital, I presented it to her. She says, I know the gal you need to go talk to. So I said, okay. So Jeannie, Jeannie was fine enough to meet with me at the hospital and we talked. And I said, the first thing I got to ask you <laughs> is, are you, I, 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 how's cancer? What's the deal with, and she said, four-time survivor. I said, your speaker, come on in. <laughs> she said, yeah, but I got all these. I said, I don't give a, I don't give a damn about any of that. Yeah, yeah. You're a four-time cancer survivor, honey. That's the only qualifications you need because you know what hell looks like. Indeed. You've been there, man. You've had death stare you in the face. You can't learn that. You don't learn that in those got to beat it. I beat it once and it about killed me. She's four times. So I think she's qualified. Tonight she's going to share with us her, get all my stuff out of the way here. I asked her to come in and share tonight. She's kind enough to come in and it's not a, I've, I'm going to just say it because you're going to do it. You will do it. I want to hear her personal side. Tonight she's here professional. I respect that and I love you for it. Four time cancer survivor, I want to know that story. And I want you to know it. I want you to know it, right? Huh? I want you to know it. How many times are you? Three. There you go. She's four times. Yeah, I was just going to say. I'm not thrilled somebody beat my record. <laughs> I'm not thrilled at all. <laughs> it's amazing to me. I mean, that is so encouraging. And you two reoccurrence people and, and things that are two or three times, four time cancer alive and well, and speaking here tonight to a cancer group that should have never been here because none of us should be here. But we are, and we're moving forward. And so I appreciate. Janine taking her time from work and being with us tonight. So please welcome my new cancer warrior, Janine. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. My new friends. My name is Janine. Um, I am a clinical dietitian. I am employed at Kootenai Health Hospital. I also work um, occasionally with the cancer centers in Post Falls and in Coeur d'Alene. Um, and so, though I have my own cancer history, and it has, it's epic in its own right, um, tonight, like Jim said, I am here um, as a clinical dietitian, and I'm really excited um, because my history with cancer is kind of what urged me to get into this field. You know, I mean, Many of us um, understand people that maybe when they've gone into the healthcare system, they have a story of why, like maybe their mom or their dad or a sibling or their own health history, you know, and that kind of makes them want to investigate and then kind of learn and then, hey, if I know this, then I can help other people. So that's kind of what brings me here this evening. I will say that when um, I was um, asked to come and speak, several months back, I was thinking to myself, oh my goodness, what shall I, what shall I talk about? And um, Jim had let Tolly know that some of the people here um, are patients that are undergoing active treatment. And some patients are here that are no longer undergoing treatment, maybe they're stable. And then some people here are actual caregivers. And so, my heart was like, well, what, what is something that is needful for active treatment 
for post-treatment and for the caregivers. What's something that we all have in common that's really, really helpful to know that maybe some people wouldn't know about? And then it came to me, protein! Mm -hmm. Because as you're gonna find out, hopefully, unless you know all of this, if you know all of this, don't let me know that. <laughs> Just pretend like you're learning some things, okay? Um, so um, without further ado, I do have a real short video to share with you. Um, I came across it when I was doing some research and it is um, all about protein and its effect and importance on skeletal muscle. And it has a real target for patients undergoing chemotherapy with, with cancer. So Nathan, I'm gonna really try to do this. He told me to do that and then do this. <laughs> okay, let's try it. Do I have to maximize it too? You can. Our body is made of nutrients and substances that are the building blocks for our body composition. These build our bone, fat, and muscle. A very important body component for maintaining good health is our skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle makes up approximately 40% of our body weight. Skeletal muscle is vital for movement and balance, but it's also essential to our physical strength, immune system, and healing of wounds. Muscle houses most of our body's protein. That protein is mobilized if we're sick or malnourished, or when we're not getting enough protein in our diet. There's more than meets the eye when it comes to body weight and our muscles. Low muscle mass may be a hidden problem. Measuring body weight alone doesn't tell us how much muscle we have. In fact, people with the same body weight can have different amounts of muscle mass. Low muscle mass can also occur in some people living in larger body sizes. In this example, two people have the same body weight and look the same on the outside. However, one of them has low muscle mass, while the other has a normal amount of muscle mass. We can lose muscle mass as we age, or with illness or injury. People who are on bed rest or hospitalized can lose muscle quite quickly. Low muscle mass can occur with many health problems, cancer, diabetes, osteoarthritis, adiposity, diseases of our kidneys and liver, heart disease, HIV AIDS, and lung diseases like COPD. Because muscle mass is so important for good health, losing muscle leads to many severe health problems. This can include challenges with physical function and mobility, poor quality of life, more complications during and after surgeries, and longer hospital stays. Even more concerning, having low muscle mass is linked to shorter survival times for people with health problems. The consequences of low muscle mass have been studied in depth in cancer. Low muscle mass can happen at any stage of cancer, from early to terminal. It can increase a person's chances of severe side effects from chemotherapy and of their cancer progressing. Low muscle mass is also linked to shorter survival times for people with cancer. Preventing and reversing low muscle mass has the potential to improve health outcomes and survival. It can also reduce people's use of the healthcare system, which ultimately reduces healthcare costs. So preventing and reversing low muscle mass is tremendously important. We can support good muscle mass by treating diseases and exercising. Nutrition is an essential piece of the puzzle because it supplies the nutrients and substances that we need to build muscle. Like the ugly duckling, nutrition is often overlooked. Many people don't give it the attention that it deserves for its essential role in preventing and reversing low muscle mass. Just like the air we breathe, we need nutrients to build muscle. Several nutrients can help build and support muscle mass, and protein is essential as the main building block of muscle. Our goal is to raise awareness of how important muscle mass is to our health. We create targeted strategies based on nutrition to prevent and treat muscle loss in people with many different diseases. Nutrition has a critical role to play in rebuilding muscle mass to support overall health and recovery from disease. We believe that good nutrition is a therapy. We can and should use our food as medicine for better health. And our research is exploring how we can use nutrition 
as a powerful therapy to live longer and better lives. So our um, uh, learning objectives this evening are going to be understand the importance of protein. That's pretty much why I'm here. Um, I'd like to describe the building blocks of protein. Again, if you already know this answer because you remember biology, human biology in school or things like that, just keep it to yourself for now. Uh, provide protein recommendations based on our needs. If you are undergoing cancer treatment, your needs are gonna be different from someone who is a caregiver and not undergoing cancer treatment. Identify protein containing foods, as well as tips for increasing protein in the diet. Okay, to begin with, protein is an essential macronutrient. There's two key words here. Number one is essential, and the other one is macronutrient. Essential in this context means that the body cannot make it on its own. It must come from the diet. Okay, our body can produce a lot of things, but it cannot produce protein, all right? We can store fat and calories and things like that, but we can't make dietary protein. The other um, key word here is macronutrient. I'm going to contrast macronutrients to micronutrients. Micronutrients are going to be your vitamins and minerals that your body must have, but they're micronutrients because they are needed in small amounts. Macronutrients on the other side, the body requires in large amounts to maintain health, all right? So vitamins and minerals, these are gonna be your calories, your fat, and your protein, the macronutrients, okay? All right, protein is composed of tiny building blocks called amino acids. I'm wearing a strand of pearls. Pretend that this strand is a protein molecule, all right? Each one of these little beads here are amino acids that make up the protein molecule. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. All right, protein is found throughout the body. It is found in your muscle tissue. It's found in your bones your skin, your hair, even your blood. Virtually every cell within the human body contains protein. We're gonna go on to the roles of protein next. Protein does most of the work within the body, all right? Um, it requires, it's required for the structure, the function, and regulation of organs and tissues. The, there's many critical roles um, in the body, including boosting immunity. Anybody heard of an antibody before? It plays a pretty, cool, pretty critical role in your immune system, right? Antibodies are protein molecules, all right? Um, enzymes, has anybody ever eaten a meal in your life? Yeah, guess what? In order for that, that food to be digested, right? It requires enzymes to break that food down into smaller particles that then provide you energy. Guess what? Enzymes are protein, okay? Blood clotting. Anybody ever had a bleeding wound or something and then you get a little scab and that blood clotting there, right? That is made up of protein <coughs> molecules. Muscle contraction, raising my leg when I'm going for a hike or something like that, that requires protein. Hormones are made of protein, your sex hormones, insulin, if you or someone that you know um, has diabetes, they would be very familiar with insulin, all right? Um, and then sleep. Everyone needs to, have, needs to sleep. And there is a certain hormone called melatonin, and it is a protein, all right? It's also a structural component in our bones. So my, my, my bone here, right, or my finger bone, the stiffness in bone, that is made up of protein. But then contrast that with my lungs that stretch. So there's different protein used for different things, all right? So virtually every cell in the body has protein in it, okay? There are all, um, continued critical roles in the body. It carries oxygen to tissues via hemoglobin, which is a protein. Uh, fluid balance between the blood and the tissues of the body. And there's two ways that it provides energy, all right? So when someone is fasting, maybe there's lean times or they're doing intermittent fasting or something like that, and we're not getting enough calories in our body, the body breaks down skeletal muscle into those amino acids, remember the strand of, of protein, right? 
It breaks it down into amino acids and those amino acids supply energy. Here's another little fun fact. Protein is the primary energy source for your absorptive cells within your intestines. All right, that's pretty cool. I'm a, I'm a geek when it comes to that. So I thought that was pretty fascinating. All right, we're gonna now move on to the amino acids. <clears throat> All right, the body does not store dietary protein, all right? We can store extra blood sugar. Um, our muscles kind of take that up. And then for long-term storage, it kind of turns into fat for energy, but we don't have the ability to store dietary protein because there's a constant recycling process in the body of this protein, all right? Um, any type of storage in the body is very expensive, all right? It takes a lot of energy to store things in the body. So protein actually gets broken down into amino acids, and then those amino acids become, they get absorbed, and then the body recycles those amino acids into whatever type of protein the body might need. Let's say I have a nice steak, and let's say um, I, I eat that steak, my, my body breaks it down into the amino acids, and lo and behold, I maybe have a flu coming on or something like that, and I need extra immunity, right? So my body takes those amino acids from the steak and then builds new proteins for my immune system from the dietary protein that I ate. So there's this constant recycling process that goes on in the body, all right? The body cells are continually breaking proteins down and building new ones for whatever the body's needs are. We get amino acids from this recycling process within the body, but we also get amino acids from the food we eat. All right, there's gonna be three types or three categories of amino acids. And again, you guys might already be familiar with this, so just play along if you already know the answers. So there's going to be essential amino acids. And again, that's gonna be a key word, right? Essential means that the body cannot make it. We have to get it from our diet, all right? Um, and there are nine of those. I'm not going to make you memorize them. The second category or class of amino acids is going to be non-essential amino acids. Guess what? Those are the type that the body can make from the essential amino acids that we get from our food. And a third category is going to be conditional amino acids. And those we need in greater supply under times of stress, uh, injury, or illness. All right? Now we're going to move on to food. Anybody here like food? <laughs> okay. All right. What are protein-containing foods? All right. Um, a lot of people that I, that I connect with, whether it's in the cancer center or inpatient dietetic, or inpatient people when I'm um, consulted to speak with them, or even my friends and family, when I ask them, what types of foods do you think have protein in them? And most of them will say, well, you know, chicken and fish and steak and th eggs and things like that. And I'm going, you're correct. So the first type that I would like to introduce to you, if you don't know this, is animal, um, animal containing foods are a complete protein. And that when I say complete protein, that means it has all of the nine essential amino acids in adequate amounts to meet the body's needs. Okay, so picture an egg, a large egg, and we'll get, I think there's a slide later on. It has about seven grams. It's gonna depend upon if it's an extra large egg or a large egg or whatever. It's gonna have about seven grams of protein that seven grams of protein is gonna be made up of amino acids. And of those amino acids, there's gonna be all nine of the essential amino acids that my body is going to need. Okay, it's an animal food. It comes from nature. It has all of the essential amino acids in there. All right, that's why it's considered a complete protein. But my friends, animal sources are not the only sources of um, protein. We can also get protein from plants, all right? So plants, I'm thinking of peanut butter, okay? Peanuts are a legume, they're a plant, they're grown, and guess what? They have the essential amino acids. You look on the back of that Adam's jar, I love Adam's crunchy peanut butter, 
because there's nothing added to it, right? You look on the back and it says it has what, maybe nine grams of protein or something on there for two tablespoons, I think is the serving. Um, and guess what? It's gonna have the essential amino acids in there, right? But it's not a complete protein, even though it has those essential amino acids, because it doesn't have adequate amounts of those essential amino acids to meet the body's needs. So when we have plant proteins, they're best to have throughout the day, mixing and matching and bringing them together in a meal. Uh, you don't have to have them in the same meal. I just have this preference to eat my rice and beans together. <laughs> but you don't have to. They kind of go all those amino acids from, let's say I have oatmeal in the morning, um, for lunch I have some whole wheat bread, and then for dinner I have my rice and beans. All right, throughout the course of the day, I'm having those plant-based protein foods, right? And the body will utilize the amino acids from them. And as long as I'm getting the different amino acids from those different plant foods, I get complete protein. Does that make sense? So you can get complete protein from animals because in one serving is gonna have everything that you need in adequate amounts. You can also get your protein from plant foods but they must be eaten in combinations throughout the day. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, cool. All right, so I'm gonna go back. I have to let you know, I understand that nuts do not come from animals. <laughs> but um, when I was putting together that slide, um, I just left it in there. So anyway, just so we're on the same page. <laughs> Um, so here are some of the, the plant-based um, um, protein foods. There's going to be protein found in seeds, legumes, rice, tofu is a wonderful source um, of plant-based protein, um, bread, lentils. Oh my goodness, I have an Armenian lentil soup that is wonderful. Um, and it has rice in it and oh, it's just delicious. So anyway. So I would like three volunteers, if you would be so kind, to just give me an idea of um, any of those ones or even additional plant sources of protein food that you like. And just so, so we can just share and give some other ideas. Anybody have any, what do you think? I'm addicted to chopped um, almonds. Oh! And I put them in my yogurt. Ooh. Oh, fantastic. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. Okay, anybody else? It adds a nice little texture to the yogurt, right? <clears throat> yeah. Oh, <gasps> yes. It's not on my list, but that's a good, but that's why I'm asking for volunteers. Anybody else have a plant source of protein that they really like? I like broccoli, but I don't know. That's... Yeah, that's, that, that's not going to be the same, um, but we'll get to a, a website that I'm going to recommend you all um, kind of write down and there might be some amino acids in there um, but it's not going to provide as much as say like the edamame or the tofu or things like that okay here is a little chart of some great ways to combine some of the um, uh, plant-based foods so again like let's see here I, I already talked about lentils I love um, the, the, the wild rice and then my um, basmati rice in my lentil soup. Um, chickpeas, anybody like hummus? Yeah, you have some hummus with some whole wheat pita bread. You get that complete protein there. Um, so if you mix some legumes with some grains or legumes with some seeds, legumes with some nuts, you're gonna get those amino acids from those partnering foods and they're gonna to lock together to make that complete protein, okay? So I like this one because it kind of gives you some good ideas. The next slide I will apologize for because it's really blurry, okay? But <laughs> bear with me because I love um, what, what it's trying to convey. Can you guys see that at all? <laughs> so there's four corners of a box, all right? In the top corner, we've got grains, then nuts and seeds, we've got dairy and legumes. Can you guys make that out okay? Mm -hmm. All right, pretty much the concept of this one, which is what I learned in grad school, is any four corners of these plant-based, and again, dairy is not plant-based, um, but it pretty much completes the other ones, 
right? So, but when you combine any two of those plant-based amino acids, those amino acids that are complementary, all right, they come together and they make a complete protein. Has anybody noticed the cost of food going up and your grocery bill like, ah, right? So this is another way that you can get your protein needs met by having some plant-based protein along with your animal-based protein. If you're not a, a vegan, then that's gonna be sole source, right? So I like this one just simply because it has all four corners. You got your grains, your nuts and seeds, your dairy, and then your legumes, all right? There will be a quiz at the end of this lecture. So just pay attention to this one, all right? We've got our grains, nuts and seeds, legumes, and dairy, okay? All right, I warned you. All right, moving on to nutrient needs. As we discussed earlier on, and also as that video portrayed, when we are undergoing cancer and cancer treatment, our nutritional needs um, go up, all right? All right, again, when in times of stress, when there's an injury and disease, our calorie needs and our protein needs go up. When we have cancer, I wish I would have underlined this, I didn't. When we have cancer, my friends, the body breaks down more protein than it can make. Wow. All right? Cancer cells are rapidly reproducing cells. Nasty boogers. Our, our protein intake must outpace the breakdown of the protein in our body. Okay? Right there, it says it better than I did. Protein intake must exceed the protein losses occurring with anti-cancer treatment. Make sure you tuck that one away. Very, very important, all right? The key is gonna be prevention of lean muscle mass. Sometimes when we go through treatment, it's gonna happen. And so we wanna mitigate it as much as possible by increasing our dietary protein intake, okay? Here are the recommendations. It's gonna be based on your health status. Again, when we're undergoing active cancer treatment, it's gonna be different than with someone status post, status post cancer treatment, and someone who's a caregiver or whatever. Also, age is gonna play a factor as well as our activity, right? If we are an active individual, we're gonna need more. If we're sedentary, we're gonna need less. Um, so for since this was a, a lung cancer support group, I went ahead and um, grabbed the recommendations for patients with lung cancer. And this is going to be generalized, right? This does not take into consideration if there's kidney disease, if there's heart um, failure, any other, other, other comorbidities. What's recommended is going to be 20 to 35 kilogram or kilocal kilocalories per kilogram of body weight and then protein 1.2 to 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram some of you may say what how what weight i i know what i weigh in pounds i don't know what kilograms are yeah. you must be an american like i am yeah. so <laughs> this is how you figure it out you, there's 2.2 pounds per kilogram you take your body weight in pounds Divide that by 2.2 kilograms or 2.2 pounds per kilogram and you get your kilograms of body weight. So for an example, a 170 pound adult, we're going to take 170 pounds, divide that by 2.2, it's going to be 77.2 kilograms. We take that 77.2 kilograms, we multiply it by 30 to 35 to get their calories per day. We take that 77.2 kilograms and multiply it by 1.2 and then 1.5 to get that range of protein that they should get in a day. And again, that's just a range of protein to aim at, all right? Okay, those that are caregivers, I did not forget about you, all right? The acceptable macronutrient distribution range, that's a mouthful for protein for most healthy adults is going to be about 10 to 35% of your calories 
a day, all right? So here's an example. A caregiver, they get about 2,000 calories in their diet, all right? Um, that is gonna break down to about, about 10 to 35% of that 2,000 calories. It's gonna be right around 50 to 175 grams of protein a day for that caregiver. Now you might be thinking at first glance, that's a lot, 175 grams of protein a day? Oh my goodness. However, keep in mind, that's, that's a big range, 10 to 35% of 2,000, right? If you are a very active person, you need more. So then you would eat closer to the 150 to 175 grams a day. If you are more of a, a sedentary individual, you would just follow suit and eat less protein on that range. Does that make sense? Okay, that's why it is a percentage. And here, it's pretty much the same for the males and the females, 10 to 35%. All right, here's an example of just a serving of protein, which is gonna be approximately seven grams um, for one ounce. And that's gonna be one ounce of meat, fish, or poultry. And ladies and gentlemen, they're gonna, if you break it down, the meat is going to be more dense in protein than your poultry and your fish. This is just an estimate, all right? There's a website that I'll share with you later. You can actually get in there and get all the specifics. It's fascinating. All right, one large egg, a serving, right around seven grams of protein. One half cup of tofu, right around seven grams of protein. And then a half a cup of cooked beans or lentils, all right? These are all examples of one serving of protein. Here's some tips for increasing protein. Milk products are wonderful because they, um, they provide some fat, they provide some calories, and they provide some protein. Um, those of us that can't tolerate liquid dairy, but we can tolerate maybe some cottage cheese or some, some Greek yogurt, um, adding some of those into a smoothie or having it for breakfast. Um, keep in mind, another little tip for you is Greek yogurt typically will be double the protein than non-Greek yogurt. Like the Yoplait little whipped yogurts, that's pretty much just sugar, right? So try to stay, they taste really good because it's the sugar, but they're not, they're not really nutritionally dense. Um, but Greek yogurts, and again, this is very generalized state, statement, Greek yogurts tend to be double the protein than the non-Greek yogurts. So that's a really good source for you, okay? Um, let's see here. Here's some more high protein foods, eggs. Um, some of our patients will, um, in their Instapot or their pressure cooker or even boil on the stove, they'll put some eggs in there and they'll just, you know, cook up a batch in bulk and then keep them in the refrigerator and they're already made they just crack them and then either put them in a salad or have them as a snack. It's almost an instant food, right? You're getting seven grams of, of protein right around um, for one egg, all right? Uh, make sure they're well cooked though, all right? No, no over easy or, or sunny side up or whatever the other one is, okay. Uh, meats, poultry, and fish. I think we've already talked about this one. You can add them into dips. You can add them onto salads. Um, one of the things that I like to do is to get a rotisserie chicken um, and because it's easy, it's already cooked and then uh, dice some of that up and put it on top of the salad. Add some seeds and nuts for good measure. Um, you're just getting some extra, a boost of protein and calories in there. Beans, legumes, nuts and seeds, wonderful sources of protein. Again, sprinkle those seeds on your, or the nuts on your yogurt and things like that on your oatmeal. Um, uh, put them in your breads if you're a baker. Um, a, a really great one is to spread some peanut butter on some toast um, or add it into um, a milkshake or something. Here's some additional tips. It might be kind of hard, and I understand some of us are um, appetite decreases when we are undergoing treatment. I understand that all too well. Uh, what you can do, though, is um, try to eat protein-containing foods at your meals, 
all right, um, at snacks and before bed. I like consuming protein before bed because it provides your body those amino acids while you're sleeping during that time of regeneration and recuperation and healing, okay? So having a little bit of protein before you go to bed, it goes a long way. Oral nutrition supplements. We dietitians, we love oral nutrition supplements. <laughs> um, those are, it's another word for protein shakes. Some of you may have seen Boost or Ensure. Um, there's also the premier protein shakes that they sell at Costco. Um, they're, they come in like, I think they're like 11 ounce cartons. And uh, um, they are wonderful sources of, of drinkable protein. Um, the protein amounts in those cartons are going to vary depending upon the brand, all right? So like when we're in the hospital, we've got Ensure because we partner, we have a contract with Abbott. Um, and there we have, we, we do two different um, Ensure products in the hospital. We have a higher protein, which is called Ensure Max. Luckily, it's lower in sugar, so it's not going to affect people with diabetes or things like that. Um, and then we have uh, just a more moderate um, Ensure product and it comes with 20 grams of protein. So you're gonna find varying levels of protein in those um, oral nutrition supplements. Um, let's see, I know the Premier Protein, because um, I have some of those at home, they have 30 grams of protein um, per bottle. Keep in mind, my friend, friends, that these um, oral nutrition supplements are not meant to be sole source nutrition. They are supplements. They're to supplement your oral intake of your meals, okay? They're a wonderful, wonderful way to get in extra calories and protein, but ideally and optimally, it's best to get our nutrition from food. If we're not able to get that adequately, by all means, oral nutrition supplements are a wonderful way to get in extra nutrition. Um, I came across this study, you guys, patients with lung cancer, it shows that patients with lung cancer had improved weight and, in, and intake with oral nutrition supplements, as opposed to those that didn't con consume oral nutrition supplements, all right? And also when we're going through, and I just remember this from my own health history, when we're going through treatment and we develop <clears throat> either dysphagia and we're not able to swallow very well or chewing difficulties, mucositis, and I don't know if you guys has, have heard of that, where your mouth, the whole upper area of your um, upper GI um, becomes inflamed and you can't eat, you can't swallow. Um, it's much easier to drink your, your um, food than it is to chew and eat and swallow. Did that make sense? So again, these oral nutrition supplements are a wonderful, wonderful gift. Protein powder. Um, it can become in whey protein, pea protein, if you like plant-based protein. Um, some ideas, make smoothies out of them, add some fresh or frozen fruit, some vegetables if you want to. Um, I will oftentimes, when I'm in a hurry, just take a scoop of that protein powder, put it in my shaker bottle, add some water, and I'm gone. <laughs> um, add, again, to enhance and fortify your oatmeal. Have some of that protein powder on your oatmeal, add it to smoothies. Some people have, have been known to add it to their pancake batter to kind of get their, their, um, their foods that they normally eat extra fortified with, it, with some protein. And then here, if you have no appetite, um, try to get in at least two bites per meal. All right, those two bites can add up and go a long way. And I've actually spoken with, with patients and they have said, I tried it. And when I speak with them a week later, and they'll say, after I got in two bites, I realized that I could get another bite in. And then I realized I could get another bite in. So try at least to get in a couple bites, all right? That can really help. All right, we're gonna review. How am I doing on time? No, we're good. Am I, am I good? Okay. Your mom's a little sour. Okay, review, all right. Remember, there's gonna be a little pop quiz at the end, but we're gonna review first. <laughs> protein is fundamental to life. We began our, our slides with that, right? It's in, it, we need it for blood. We need it to digest our food. We need it for oxygen to be able to breathe. 
Our bones need it to be able to stand up. My lungs have to have it to be able to stretch. Protein is fundamental to life. Amino acids are the building blocks of protein. Essential, keyword essential amino acids cannot be made by the body. We must get them from food. The body recycles amino acids by breaking down protein to build new protein for whatever needs the body might have at that time. Protein, oh, I wish I would have highlighted this one. Protein intake must exceed protein breakdown. Otherwise, our muscles, like it said in that video it showed, you know, two, body, two people of the same body size, yet one had adequate protein or ad adequate muscle and the other person's muscles were kind of sh shrinking, right? So protein intake must exceed protein breakdown. Protein needs increase in times of stress, injury, and illness. Dietary protein is found in animal foods, which is a complete protein, again, because all those essential amino acids are in adequate amounts to meet the body's needs by itself. But it's also found in plant foods. They have the essential amino acids, but not in adequate amounts to eat by itself. Like if I just have a bowl of rice, it's not gonna be the same as having a piece of chicken, right? But if I have rice and beans, good to go, okay? All right, you guys ready for your quiz? Okay. Protein is critical for body functioning. Let's see. Ha ha! Nice. All right. The building blocks of protein are? Let's see. Ha ha! Well done. Okay. There is no need for increased protein intake when undergoing cancer treatment. Hmm. Complete protein foods contain all nine of the essential amino acids. They can be found in eggs, fish, meat, dairy, poultry, or cotton candy. What do you think? No cotton candy. No cotton candy? Really? Do you guys all agree? Yeah. Okay. You have my brother-in-law, Michael, to thank for that one. So he gave me that one. That was a good one. Okay. All right. One last, one last question on the quiz here. <clears throat> the missing complementary plant food source to make a complete protein is, what do you think? Dairy. Okay, what do we have? We have our dairy down here. We have our grains and we have our nuts and seeds. What would be missing? So it's, we're, that's good. We're looking for plant protein sources. Yeah, so plant, remember the four corners of the square? We had grains, nuts and seeds, even though dairy is not plant food, it's a, a good completer. What's the one that's missing? Legumes, Legumes? let's see. Oh, you passed! Wow. Well done, you guys. All right, here um, are some helpful websites. Um, I don't know if you guys wanna write this down, if it's important to you. If not, it's not, not a big deal. If you wanna take a picture with your smartphone. My Food Data, this one right here, it's not, um, it's not a uh, governmental site. It's not an educational site. However, all of the articles on food are written by um, biologists, chemists, physicians, and dietitians. So the food, or the food, I need to have dinner. Um, every article that's written has been written by a person who knows what they're talking about and it's backed up by evidence-based science. Every little article will have a little tiny um, link to the research article that that information came from. So it's a really, really good one, okay? I like it because it's also in lay terms. So, you know, when you get out of grad school and you just kind of want to know the information, that's a great one. I also recommend it because if you wanted to... Go ahead. Okay. If you wanted to compare, okay, if I'm going to have a cup of rice and beans and I really want to know the amino acid profile and I want to compare that to a six ounce or a three ounce steak, you can do that on that website. You can see all the specifics. It's wonderful. Um, it'll also, if you, I just put like, let's say I, I put in um, yogurt 
and I actually add in some chopped almonds, you know, a couple tablespoons of chopped almonds, and I have the brand of the yogurt, you know, that I'm, I'm consuming, and it will actually give me the specific profile of the nutrition found in that. So it's a wonderful resource, okay? Um, and then all the data that, um, the next one is going to be um, the USDA Food Data Central. That is a governmental site, and that one up there, all the information on the food, they draw from this one. So it's a really, really good one, all right? Um, let's see here. I think I was getting that confused with healthline.com. So everything I said about um, written by doctors and um, chemists and biologists and dietitians, that's this one. That one up there is pretty much a database. Is that what you were going to say? No, I just wanted to add on Mark Food Data. Uh, something that's really fun about that site is you can reverse look up. So if you feel, or if somebody told you you needed more vitamin C in your diet, you can search vitamin yes. C. And it will rank order the best sources available. There's actually, yeah, and there's printouts. You can click the printout little little button and it'll say the top 10 foods ranked in that, that nutrient, whether it's iron, protein, B12, yeah. whatever. So, it so is, it's yeah. Fun yeah. Because you can, you might go on a little adventure and find some foods maybe you don't eat all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. find out, oh, I, I like that. What do you know? It's a super yeah, because, you know, they, they push so many um, over the counter vitamins. I get so sick of taking pills now. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take fish oil, beef. Right, right, right. And one day I just spent the time looking up all of those um, vitamins they said I had to take to see, well, what food has the highest, uh, like um, mm -hmm. omega-3 was the one I was really after because I don't really like to eat fish, but uh, the highest omega-3 Sorry, yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So that one. So that one is fantastic. You might even want to, when you get that website, bookmark it to your favorites because it's a great go-to resource. The American Cancer Society is also a great um, resource for people. Um, it's it's written in um, you know just everyday language that really make makes it easy to understand. This is the one that I was telling you about that is also very easy to understand. So, and then here are all of my many references um, that I used for to draw from for this presentation. And then I would like to say thank you very much for letting me come and share. You guys have been delightful. Thank you for not blurting out, we already know that, or whatever. So I appreciate it. Um, and then are there, I'd like to begin, if there's any questions about what we talked about during this presentation, are there any questions? Yeah, questions about question. what we didn't talk about. Yeah, yeah. I'll get to those. Sugars. I'll get to those. Oh, okay. Are there any questions about protein, nutrient needs? Yes. What is the protein level you should have going through treatment? Yep, that's a great question. And it's going to be right around 1.2 to 1.5 grams. Okay. per kilogram of body weight a day. Okay. All right, so for you, you would take your body weight in pounds, divide that by 2.2, that would give you your kilograms. Mm -hmm. And then multiply that by 1.2 as the bottom range of that protein, okay. and then to 1.5, and that would give you a good range of what you would need. Again, no yeah, so again, again, that's gonna be a very, that's gonna be a very uh, gross estimate because Again, I, it's gonna vary depending on the type of cancer, okay. whether there's active treatment um, and any other conditions, right? So that's a pretty general gauge. Any other questions about, yes, ma'am? Could you repeat the steps of how to do that? You yes, take yep, you take your weight in pounds, mm -hmm. divide that by 2.2, that's gonna give you your kilograms of weight then you're gonna multiply that by 1.2 to give you the low end range of your protein needs, and then take the kilograms, multiply it by 1.5, and that's gonna give you the upper range. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good questions. Yeah, yes? Do you consider, or would you consider um, tortillas in the bread category? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, yeah, they're delicious too. Yeah. Of course, it, it says milk on there. Mm -hmm. Is that like, does it matter like if it's whole milk or 1% or 2% or? That's going to be the fat percentage. 
So it's still going to have the protein. Yeah. So just milk. Milk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, then, and on bread and stuff, I think it said like wheat bread or is that better than like white? Yes. So there, so when we think of a refined grain, when we think of a whole grain, the grain kernel itself is all intact. It's going to have the, it's going to have the bran, the germ and the endosperm. So it's going to have all of the parts of that wheat berry. So it's going to have good amounts of fat. It's going to have good amounts of protein in there, right? When we refine, that's going to be your whole grain, your whole wheat bread. When we refine that bread uh, or that wheat kernel, to make white bread, we're stripping away the fat and all we're getting is the carbohydrate part. So there's little protein left in white bread. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and don't get me started on that one. So, <laughs> so that's a great question. Any other questions regarding this content here? Okay, so any other questions? I will try to answer them the best I can. Well, our biggest question is sugar. You know, we keep hearing how sugar causes cancer or it feeds the cancer. Okay. And then when he was going through chemo, they said, don't worry about it because the chemo kills the cells that are grabbing on to the sugar. And so we thought, okay. So, but, uh, so we're wondering about sugar, how you felt about that, and also how you felt about the sugar free, the, what they call. No sugar candy. But there's that. Fake sugar, mm -hmm. yeah, fake sugar versus yeah. cane sugar. Yeah, yeah, great question. I'm glad you asked. So um, I will say, does sugar cause cancer? Uh, sugar is inflammatory by nature, all right? So um, when it is highly refined sugar, uh, the refinement of that is going to make it just, it's gonna hit the bloodstream and it's just gonna cause inflammation throughout the whole body. When we have cancer friends, um, we don't, we don't, we want to limit that inflammation response, right? Um, does sugar feed cancer? Sure. Does sugar feed brain cells? Sure. Does sugar feed my muscles? Sure. <laughs> sugar is a fuel for the body. It's a carbohydrate. It breaks down into blood glucose, right? So sugar, just like um, any other food is going to feed your cells. Anything in excess is going to be bad for the body. I am a human and I have a sweet tooth and it's Christmas season and it's very, very difficult for me. <laughs> right? We, I have dietitian friends that are bringing in homemade fudge. Yeah. <laughs> right? So what I would recommend is um, get your nutrition from foods. Uh, it's rare that I would find sugar cane growing that we would go out and cut it and start chewing on it, right? So um, it's best to get your, your nutrients from foods. However, I also understand that we humans need times of enjoyment, celebration, um, things like that. But I would, I would caution of over consuming anything that's made from highly refined sugar um, just because of that inflammatory response. Would I be afraid that it feeds cancer? Not so much, um, because if my, if my nutrition is coming from food, there's not gonna be a whole lot of room because of the fiber in my, my vegetables and my fruit. Um, if I have a piece of fudge, that's gonna be okay. If I'm having multiple amounts of fudge every single day, is that gonna be bad for me? Yes, um, yeah. So I hope that helps. Well, I'm going to squeal on him, but because he, uh, you know, he's got a sweet tooth, but, but he discovered those new um, sugar-free, those little Hershey, they're real tiny. Yeah. So he goes, I'm only having a couple a day. Yeah. But they're full of the fake sugar. Okay. So, uh, I can't think of the name. Okay. So, so. I worry about that. One. Yeah. And I understand. And I think your concern is coming from mm -hmm. a really good place. Um, we when we are when we when we are facing i'll put it to you this way when we are facing something like cancer um and you can get any information on the internet whether it's wrong or whether it's right there will be data to back that up it's scary right so be careful of what you take as truth right um when it comes to you know artificial um sugars 
Um, I think in moderation, they're okay because when we are undergoing cancer treatment, our tastes oftentimes change and we're not able to get hardly any nutrition in. So guess what? If all you can get in is gonna be a piece of Christmas fudge um, or maybe a couple of those, those artificially flavored candies, um, but it, it helps you um, during that time of crisis with cancer treatment, I think that's acceptable. Um, I remember this, this man here, um, Jim told me that when he was undergoing treatment, he just had no appetite. And he ate something that was, you know, pretty, uh, um, you would think pretty high in sugar. Weren't they gummy bears or something? Yeah. And, and he said, but that's all I could get in, right? But that provided his body some calories, you know? So um, I think, again, you have to take it in context, right, within, within the situation. Um, I do not recommend anybody just go out and start drinking, you know, full sugar sodas and high energy drinks um, and large amounts, large volumes of alcohol, which is just, just liquid sugar um, and sweets and all these types of things just because you can, um, because you're an adult and you've got a car and there's a, a store down the road. I don't recommend that, but I also understand that when our options are limited, and we have time of celebration. Um, I think anything in or everything in moderation is key to remember. Does that help? No. Okay. All right. Any other? Yes. I have a question about processed foods. Okay. Uh, yeah. I know it's it's we're trying to avoid processed foods. My question is, what exactly is a processed food? And more specifically, the the deli at uh, let's say Winco yeah. cut up a a roast beef and put it in a package and put it on the shelf. Is that processed food or is that natural food? Okay, so- and If I went home and cooked the roast beef, it would be natural. Yeah, so you just you just answered your own question. It is natural. We could, we could, we consider that not processed food. Yeah. More natural. So processed food is gonna be any type of refinement. Yes. And any type of- they don't refine that at all, do they? They just cook it. Not necessarily. Oh, yeah. Really? yeah, so what's recommended is, um, like even on the American Cancer Society's website, they recommend staying away from processed meats. Yes. Why do you think that is? What is different about processed meats? What do they put in? Yeah, that, what occurs they during- They put in something to keep Nitrates. it. Yes, yeah. what, what they, they put additional things in there that actually, if you think logically, they have to put those things in there to preserve the food yes. while it's sitting on the counter or in the cold, cold whatever thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, because that they have to keep the, the public protected from the organisms that will feed on those protein molecules, right? So anything processed is not going to be made from scratch at home. So from scratch, real food is going to be your best, best avenue to go to get your nutrition from. Um, if you're, if you're, I, I know I don't go out and slaughter my own pigs and, and smoke my own bacon and all that kind of thing. So I try to minimize the amount of uh, those processed meat um, foods in my diet, um, just to kind of cut down on the processing, uh, the chemicals that are used in the processing process. Um, that's what I would recommend is, but also to answer that your first question is, what are processed foods? Processed foods are gonna be foods that are taken from nature, go into a manufacturing plant, and are, um, for lack of a better word, processed. <laughs> and then they're packaged for usually uh, shelf stability, right? Um, and so- the same for like beans, black beans, they're processed in the can? They are, that, technically you're correct, yes. So, but what would be pro what would be the the chemical used in that would be sodium. So oh. sodium would be used to keep the organisms at bay, right? Because if we if we I don't know if you guys have ever opened up a can of vegetables or like you know of beans or something like that, and the canning process went bad, you know, and you open it up, it's a woo, how does it look or smell good, right? So processing is important. It helps um, feed the world, right? 
But when we have a choice, it's best to get your food naturally and cook it yourselves. But again, context, we can't always do that. All right. If I if I have a, an elderly parent who lives by themselves, you know, they're not going to be cooking from scratch every night. They're going to be more likely to eat from boxes and packages and canned foods and things like that. Maybe even TV dinners. Right. So it's best it, ideal if we can get our food um, from nature and get them cooked up. Right. Um, and prepare them ourselves. But then we have to also just be realistic that sometimes we're going to have to have those processed foods. So it's best if we can try to minimize our intake of those processed foods. Does that help? It helps. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I don't know if you guys are interested in this, but just in case you did, I didn't know who was going to be coming tonight. So if does anybody ha need any information on what to do when you're not feeling well, a loss of appetite, nausea or vomiting. Anybody here need some information on that? Yeah, I'd like to, could, I, could you talk a little bit about loss of appetite? Okay. That's been a big problem. Okay, okay. I get, I get a lot of this in the hospital as well as in the cancer centers. And so I didn't know if someone would be in need of this information. If you have a loss of appetite, it's best to avoid the three big meals during the day. One of those reasons are when we consume a large amount, a large volume of food that goes into the stomach, there's a large amount of stomach acid that needs to be produced to begin breaking that down. So we can mitigate that by consuming those, that, that volume of food, but break it into smaller meals throughout the day. There's going to be less stomach acid that's produced for each of those meals, okay? Schedule your meal times, friends. Don't wait until you're hungry. If you are suffering from a loss of appetite, put a little buzzer on your phone or on your watch, okay? Don't skip meals. Remember, try to get in at least a couple bites per meal. That can make a big difference. Carry snacks with you. Those little protein um, oral nutrition supplements or a snack bar if you don't have any difficulty chewing and you've got enough saliva production, carry snacks with you. Eat a bigger meal at the time of day when your appetite is going to be highest. I am a breakfast person. I love breakfast. So that's usually going to be my largest meal of the day. Other people, they love a, a big dinner. So don't force yourself to eat. Try to focus that largest meal of the day when your appetite is going to be most conducive. Milkshakes, smoothies, those oral nutrition supplements again. I'm a dietitian. We love those. If you have mild nausea and vomiting, boiled or baked meat, fish, and poultry is better than fried or um, like in the skillet, okay? Cold meat or fish. When we have nausea um, and also some vomiting, the temperature of food makes a bit a difference. So does the aroma. When we are near warmer foods being cooked on the stovetop, those, um, those food particles that we smell, that aroma, can trigger nausea. So it's best to maybe stay away from the stovetop and maybe cook them up in glass containers in the, in the microwave, okay? Also, cold foods tend to not trigger nausea as like warm and hot foods can. Um, Well-cooked eggs are a good one. Cream soups, uh, soups made with some milk. Luncheon meat, again, it's not ideal but it's cold, it's prepared, it's sliced. You can roll it up, stick it in your mouth. Um, lean ham and some Greek yogurt. Now moving on to if we have intense nausea. Okay, let's compare. Some juice type commercial protein supplements, Ensure Clear. Ensure Clear is made by, um, by Nestle, but it is a clear beverage. And so it's gonna be much lower in protein. I think it only has eight grams of protein per carton, and it's pretty sweet, um, uh, but it's going to have some nutri nutrition for you. Um, cottage cheese and fruit, again, the colder food is going to kind of help that intense nausea. Um, cold sandwiches and some cheese and crackers. The crackers, the sodium, the salt on those crackers tend to kind of help settle the, um, what's happening in that stomach, okay? All right, if you have taste changes, Try increasing the flavor of your foods with some herbs, spices, seasoning blends, marinades, and sauces. 
Um, I love this. I don't know about you guys um, when you were under, undergoing um, chemotherapy, but for me, when I had dry mouth and, and really bad poor taste, sucking on tart candies really, really helped me. Those lemon drops were wonderful, okay? Um, pickled foods, that's something I didn't try, but you could try that, all right? Um, if, you, if your foods are, um, if you wanna, if you can't taste the salt, add sugar. Sugar is that, that complement. Um, if you want to decrease something that's too sweet, then add some salt to that, okay? Here are some taste changes continued. Lemon juice on foods to mask metallic. That citric acid cuts that a metallic taste. Plastic utensils is a really good tip. So the, the metal of your silverware, um, you're putting that directly onto your tongue, all right? That's not gonna be so pleasant, but if you use plasticware, it's gonna be better for you. Uh, good, oral, good oral hygiene. Um, brushing your teeth after every meal. I swear by this. When I had my stem cell transplant over at the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center in, in Seattle, I was religious. I had horrible mucositis. My mouth turned black. I lost the top of my tongue. I couldn't eat for three months. Thank God for feeding tubes. I rinsed my mouth religiously throughout the day and it helped it didn't make it go away but it helped promote the healing and it kept my mouth clean this is wonderful wonderful if you know of anybody um, that is having um, mucositis or anything like that taste changes that's a good one for them okay i had i had, I had wonderful results with that. I, fantastic I, I, I could feel the sores coming on and I'd rinse yep. my mouth and by the next day, I mean, I kind of, it's kind of like my mouth battled it the whole time I was yes. in chemo. Yeah. But yeah. I never really developed a bad mouth stuff, but I could tell they were right there. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I still do it. I, and I'm going to Yay. continue to do it forever. I really, Yay. really found that yeah. successful for me. Good. And I don't, I don't know if it's the sodium in the salt or if it's the baking soda um, or the combination of the two that's also anti-inflammatory. Um, so it doesn't, it, it promotes healing, right? Yes. Um, but it also cuts down on the amount of inflammation in the mouth. So just don't, don't swallow. No, no. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. And that, and that was all the tips that I had. I was trying to, to guess if you had any questions. So, mm -hmm. all right. Well, that's it for me. That's very good. Excellent. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it.